YouTube kick. I'm not making this video again. Look, there's an interview between a trans individual. Oh, no, a queer individual a doctor who talks about trans surgery. It gets real juicy. Let's just get right into it. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Let's start um, with introductions. Could you please tell us your name and your pronouns? Yeah, perfect. Uh, my name's Blair Peters. Um, I use he and they pronouns, and I am a gender-affirming surgeon located in Portland, Oregon. That That's all we need to know. Let's get right into it. You know what's so funny? Every time I see somebody with the, you know what's, when you used to see people with a hair color, you just thought they were a little out there. They were a little outgoing. Now you see somebody with a different hair color, you're like, mm, I already know what that means. Sad. Sad. Can't even have hair color anymore. I don't know why this video is not wanting to play for me. Why is it taking so long to play the individual video? I'm not doing this video again, and if I have to go over it, I will. Let's just let, let me just let me just explain this video why I'm trying to get it to play here. Look, what ends up happening is this man ends up talking about you know vaginal plastic and then ends up talking about how we have um, gotten to this point where we have more people who are needing to have a vulvoplasty instead of a vaginoplasty i hope i'm saying that correctly so what i've seen and what i read up on was a volvo a plasty so people who have a vaginoplasty end up having to dilate the rest of their life and they always end up having complications and i won't give it to this doctor i'm not going to kill him i'm obviously against the trans surgery but this doctor doesn't say oh you know go do what you got to do you he doesn't lie in this thing he doesn't say there's not going to be complications he's very on par when he says you know what if you do this vaginal surgery, it's going to be a very long road for you. But the one thing I am against with this individual is that at no point does he ever try to stop people from having the surgeries. He may, he will never say, oh, people come in and we decide not to do something well, with them. Yeah. He'll so, come in. Yeah, that's partly. All right, um, here we go. Regardless of technique, whether it's standard penile inversion, intestinal vaginal plasty, um, or robotic, lifelong dilation is pretty much the rule um see we've seen patients coming back even 20 plus years out from a vaginal plasty that have something happen in their life that they just don't dilate and are having sex for a year and they will lose a lot of um, a lot of depth doesn't tend to be a width issue so much but definitely will lose a lot of depth so let's stop right there so right there he talks about the, the individuals having to go through something for the rest of their life, pretty much 20 years down the road. Now, if you don't know what dilation is, let me explain it to you. So you take something that is not necessarily people think it's a dildo. You know, I'm just going to go ahead and say the word just for medical reasons. But people think that it, when they think about it, they think about a sex toy, something you would just get at your local store. Well, not exactly. So what they have is actually and I'll use this pin as an example. So let's say we have this pin, right? You'll have this pin. And then at the very end of this pin, you will have something that looks like this, right? So it kind of looks like this at the as you look at the toy. It always has an arch at the very end of it. And they use this thing to keep the hole open and they try to do their very best to also make sure that they have enough depth, right? Enough depth so when somebody is to have any sexual encounter with this individual, they can go a little bit deeper. The problem is, is that you have to do this every single day on the day. This man ends up talking about it's a 20 year thing. But later on in the interview, he also talks about how some people will come in, even when they've been doing the dilation and all that stuff and doing sexual things, they end up losing depth anyway. So that means what? You still have to continue to go back in there and have surgery. And you notice he talked about robotics. So now they have, a, and this is not new news, but they have robotics who help with this kind of stuff to help create the vaginal wall within these people who have these vaginal plastics. They use a robotic, little, a robotic doctor to do all this stuff, just to just give clarification on that. I'm just saying, when you decide you're going to go in here and do these kind of things, remember, it is a lifelong, every single day, never stops. Okay? Never stops. This man said, 20 years down the road, you're still coming in for the same surgery. This will cost you a fortune to keep up. A fortune. And like I said, the one thing I did like about the doctor is that he said that maybe we can go other routes, but all of them always end in surgery. I had not heard, I didn't hear one time this man said, hey, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't have the surgery. All he ever does is have a conversation about having this surgery or that surgery. Let's continue on. If this video continues to play for me. You know how I go. So let's start at 23. 23.34. It's being complicated today. We're just, we're just, we're just gonna work with what we got. So later on, he goes on to talk about these differences between 
the uh, vaginoplasty and vulvoplasty. And it, the differences I found is that with somebody, um, I'll explain it right quickly. Huge, huge difference. One of the things is when somebody has a uh, vulvoplasty, I believe it's what it's called, is that you don't have a vaginal canal. What you end up doing is getting just a vagina that looks and just has a clitoris. And what people end up doing is they end up having um, sex through the um, anal. All right, let's continue. In terms of what someone's preparation looks like with a vulvoplasty, you don't need any electrolysis because there's no internal tissue. You don't need to dilate at all postoperatively. So it's a much swifter and quicker recovery. And for many patients that don't desire sexual penetration, um, those are kind of the two questions. It's like, do you desire sexual penetration? If it's no, and are you dysphoric from not having a vaginal canal or will you be dysphoric from not having a vaginal canal? If the answer is no, then it, the next question is, well, then why are we doing a canal? Because that's where the, like, the big injury of you know rectal injury and urinary incompetence and all of those. Things. I do like that he at least explains that, hey, look, if you're going to really go through with this, like I said, he, I don't like that he doesn't even encourage not doing the surgery at all. But at least it's some, I will not even say, but at least sometimes he gets the alternative of why do you need to even have this vaginal canal at all? If you're not going to be using it for sex or anything, what is the point? Don't you know that's going to come with more complications? That is a step in the right direction. Obviously, I don't trust this man. Okay. I've seen, I've heard what he says later on in these interviews and I don't know what he talks about, but nonetheless, at least start having these conversations. That's what I at least like to see. I can't say expect everything that happened overnight, but at least we can start being like, but before you go that far, why? Let's continue. Things start to come into play. So I think part of it is a lot of patients realizing and understanding that that is an option and then, you know, knowledge is power. And I think we have a lot of people just coming in requesting vulvoplasty straight up. Um, for a lot of our patients, um, some of our adolescents, for example, That's who what I'm are not sure if they want a canal, um, we've got a couple of vulvoplasties just to sort of relieve dysphoria, have them live in that body for a couple of years and then make that decision for themselves. And that's where the sickness comes in. That's where the sickness comes in. At this point, now y'all didn't see earlier in the interview, this is where it gets brought up that people who having the surgeries are getting younger and younger. And he goes on to say, yeah, there is adolescence, but also there are people in their seventies who are doing this. Either way, it doesn't matter. But the point is, you heard how he talked about adolescents saying, well, with an adolescent, we may not do the vaginal canal. Not with adolescents, we just won't do the surgery at all. What he says is, it, and the reason he says he doesn't want to do a vaginal canal on the adolescents, what he says earlier, is because when you try to do a vaginal plasty on a young boy, right, the re they don't normally have enough tissue to make a vaginal wall, so it's a lot more complicated. So they tend to go with the vulvoplasty. Once again, remember, means there's no vaginal canal. All you have is a closed area that looks like a vagina and a clitoris. That's, that's it. There is no penetration. So they end up telling these kids to go with the Volvo. And then, like he says, later, you can go ahead and do this. You can go ahead and get the canal later on in life, but maybe you might not want to. And he goes on later to say that a lot of people who get these Volvo plastics, they don't tend to want to get the whole canal. They just end up having intercourse uh, anally. It's just a whole wild thing, man. All right. Now we see we've been struggling. So let me see if I can go a little bit forward here. Without it. Give me problem. Exploring. The okay. traditional vaginoplasty with the canal was offered because of that reinforcement of the binary that you were talking about. It's really I like how this person has a flag in the back. That's just wild to me. This is not a real background. This is the green screen, but I think it's just odd. Need to consider. Do you know of any research examining that? The only paper that I there's a paper that um, one of the vaginal plastic surgeons at OHSU put out about just the percentage of patients seeking vulvoplasty in his practice and then exploring why they had chosen vulvoplasty for themselves and then also exploring how they viewed vulvoplasty like did they view their vulva as like any less female than you know a traditional vaginal plasty with or without a canal and the answer was overwhelmingly no they viewed their genitalia just as fully feminine um at least in their sort of own internal sense of self and the choices were all over the map but it is like you say like it's the minority of people that are actually using their vaginal canals um i think a lot of people do minority. need to have a vaginal canal to feel complete for themselves and 
to, you know, have their dysphoria adequately relieved. But I think there are a lot of people over the years that have just gotten a vaginal plasty because that was what was available to them. And they're well, let's talk about that real quick. So he's saying that people who get these volvos normally feel female all the way through um, and they feel like their dysphoria goes away. I want to note that and I'm, I'm not sure if I got this completely in there. But there is a point where they say that they don't really know the end result of these volvoplasties and how it really affects people. They're not going to know for about five to ten years. Um, here's the thing, man. And I love when they talk about people with saying like, oh, right. They get the volvoplasty and they still feel like a female individual and their dysphoria is gone. Right now. Right. But what about years down the road? Y'all always talk about it as if it's a fact that if somebody gets the gender affirming surgery, it is a fact that they get happy, whether it's Volvo or whether they get the complete canal. And I love how they talk about having the canal doesn't make people, mo that's the minority of people who get the vaginal canal now that I'm learning that. So the whole concept of feeling like a female or feeling like a woman really doesn't have anything to do with that because imagine this you get your penis and testicle chopped off. And all you do is get pretty much get a closed hole with the clitoris on there. You don't even have a vaginal canal. Uh, so tell me, tell me, how does that make you a complete woman? You're pretty much a just, and I, I'm, I'm just saying this. You're just a person who's had a surgery that just made you into this. It doesn't make you anything, right? You're still either a man or you're either still a female. And one of the things he also talks about is some reason some of these people get the volvoplasty is because some people don't want to be completely male or completely female so some people will get breast removal but they'll still live they'll still leave enough breasts to where if they want to be a girl one day they can still you know wear uh bras and stuff like that they can still pass as a girl and i think that's the same thing with this vulvoplasty it's like some guys don't want to go men don't want to go all the way with the vaginal canal because they know it's going to come with more complications but also you know having that closed hole they can kind of go in between because they can't have penetration so they can kind of fall in both categories right and i just think that's still very very dangerous and odd because once again as I've listened to this interview, there is no going back that I've always mentioned. Once you have this vulva vaginal, especially if you have the vaginal plasty where you get the canal, it is a done deal, buddy. A done deal. You will be having surgery a vast majority of your life. And then he also talks about why he's against sometimes doing a vaginal plasty because it comes with the dilation that we talked about earlier. And it also comes with more infections. People tend to have more struggles when they have these canals. You tend to have more problems down the road. So that's why he normally pushes the Volvo and asks questions about that. I just wish he asked the question of, should we do this at all? And the fact that you're doing chill, you're doing this stuff on the children tells me that as much as you're trying to say that you care about people, I truly don't believe that you do because you're doing this on young children, young children. And then say, ah, oh, well, maybe down the road we can. What if they decide they want a penis again? What if they decide they want their vagina back? Gone. That that option is dead. There was never because you got to remember also when somebody gets a, a I think it's called a phalloplasty, right? P H A L L O plasty, right? When somebody has one of those and they get one of the they get a penis attached and they get the skin graft, right? They get one of those things. They end up removing ovaries. They remove body parts. So it's not like you can go, oh well, just put it back in. And Nope, that's not how it works. When you get this fake penis, they remove things from you. They remove ovaries, okay? They remove all of that up there. So let's not act like you getting that means you can just go back, because you can. All right, I got one more part I want to go over. Please play, please play, please play. Every single medical issue or problem someone has. And it just doing your five and everything. you know i don't want to have this there a common thing of a person that isn't really wanting the canal and doesn't use it and isn't doing a good job dilating and then all of a sudden is having these public floor issues and chronic discharge and infections and that's where I it just about becomes a like a huge mess so that's why i, I wanted i just want y'all to hear that part where he talks about the infections and the issues that come with that that's it. arm syndrome is this sort of concept it's not even, sorry, not a concept. It's a very I'd like to offer on this. Uh, previously, when we spoke, he used the phrase trans broken arm syndrome. Um, mm. this and is I very thought it was just such an excellent consideration for all of us as providers to keep in mind. Uh, would you mind sharing what that is and, and how you maybe see it impacting 
um, medical care for our trans patients? Yeah, definitely. Um, so trans broken arm syndrome is this sort of concept. It's not even, sorry, not a concept. It's a very real world thing, but it basically is when a healthcare professional will sometimes consciously or subconsciously attribute every single medical issue or problem someone has to their transgender identity. Um, so I think it's something that we all have to keep in mind where, yes, gender affirming surgery has complications and considerations. Yes, hormone replacement therapy can also have other things and occasionally complications. But there are millions of medical issues that are completely mutually exclusive or not mutually exclusive from someone's transgender identity. So we just kind of have to keep that in mind. And, you know, we have patients coming in for vaginoplasty consultation, for example, that have like iatrogenic urethral structures. And if we weren't thinking or looking for those things, all of a sudden they have this post-operative urinary dysfunction and we're like, oh, pelvic floor, blah, 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 blah. But no, like we've done that person a disservice because we're not looking outside of their status as a transgender individual. And I think it's just a trap that, you know, I think even I've caught myself almost falling for a few times and being like, okay, wait, like I can't just attribute this person's voiding dysfunction because they maybe have some hormonal atrophy on their penile tissues from estrogen. Like I actually have to make sure they don't have like some sort of anatomical issue or problem. Um, and I think we all just need to keep that in mind that yes, these things are related, but sometimes anything else can be going on. You know, when I hear that, it's just kind of like, well, obviously other stuff can be going on, but you kind of have to start with that. If somebody comes in for the vaginal blast, you see there's issues going on in that very area, then yes, you do need to look at it. I think this is the same concept that we hear when people talk about um, fat acceptance and obesity, right? They'd be like, well, you can't contribute everything to my obesity. Yeah, you're right. You know, you can't come in here and it's, your ankles are bad, but in your ankles could be, there could be something else going on. But you know, one of the first things that I might go to is that, you know, you are obese. So your ankles are probably struggling to hold your weight. Is that not always the problem? Of course not. But it's just sometimes, you know, these doctors aren't seeing one person a day or two people a day. Sometimes these doctors have been in their profession for 10 plus years. They've seen many of people. So they might be able to go, Oh, you have an ankle problem. You know, I dealt with this back in 95 and <laughs> or they might, they might be able to go back and say, Oh, you know, I've dealt with many of patients and we we tend to see that people who have who are obese tend to have bad ankles. You can go with that. So you can do the same thing with these people who are transgender. I wanted to talk about one more thing before I continue on. The uh the follow off plasty I wanted to talk about. That not only do they remove ovaries, they also remove your uterus. That is just another thing of telling you that you cannot go back on this. All right, let's end this thing up. Well, I'm not ending it, but you know what I mean. Towards the latter end. I like this guy's got a little in bike in the back. And like looking after people that I would otherwise like hang out with at Pride or at a queer bar or a safe space. Mm. And, you know, being able to show up to clinic with like pink hair and jeans mm. and a t-shirt and like no one's questioning my professionalism or like competency to do surgery. Um, and I think also understanding the language and the culture and being able to just go into a room and have patients you know, have these very comfortable conversations with me about sexual practices or preferences or the polyamorous relationships or how all of these things are going to interplay into what they ultimately want for themselves. Um, so I think it's a huge asset in terms of almost instantly walking into a room, just creating an environment where we have rapport, just courtesy of representation and connection to community ties. Um, and I do speak a lot about that sort of the concept of in professional or these traditional spaces like why visibility is so important um, because visibility allows for you to meaningfully represent a community of people which not only leads to better care for them but it leads to a better sense of satisfaction for you coming to work as your authentic self um, i think it's odd that you care that people want to know that you're queer when you come to work you want that visibility and so when that when people come in there to have surgeries that's going to change the rest of their life because they had a maybe struggling with who they are and everything that because they see that you're queer, they're going to feel more safe. It almost sounds like it's just saying pretty much that, Oh, I know this guy's going to validate me. Um, so I couldn't imagine a better position for me to be in. Um, I think there's nothing more powerful or more professional than someone really loving themselves enough to show up to work authentically and just take mm. pride in what they do. Mm. Um, and whether someone agrees or disagrees with you on that, I think they're going to respect you regardless because everyone else around you will. 
so beautifully said. Yeah, it's deeply fulfilling. I I have to agree. It 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 is. This is a therapist, by the way, but she doesn't really that, yeah, contribute I, to the conversation. Similarly, I don't think I could be doing this like if I wasn't a part of this community. Or I did. There's just something unspoken about it, and mm. and it is so fulfilling to see that. And um and I really love that you speak so much about representation and your always talking about how there's people med students in your dms talking about how much you're inspiring them so um thank you for all the work that you do thank you again for your time um otherwise if you don't have anything else that's all i have for you so that's what i was talking about he he, he a little bit before that he says you know being queer is so important or he feels like he, he feel like he can do the job and not be queer i just think that it's 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 odd it's odd it's odd to me that it feels like when you're even at your job or profession, at all points, you always feel like you have to authentically show who you really are. And I'm just going to attribute this to if it was me, right? If I showed up to, if I showed up to the doctor's office and I'm wearing a do-rag, right? I'm wearing a do-rag, but I'm being authentically myself, right? I'm a hood dude. That's who I am, okay? I come in with a do-rag, and I do wear do-rags. I know I'm not hood, but I'm just giving you a thing. I come in and I'm I'm knocking my do rag right, knocking my do rag, looking the way I do. Does that make me less of a doctor? Of course not. But is there a different professionalism that comes with that? Yes. Do I feel like I need to show myself off as a person who comes from a certain different graphic by wearing my do rag or saying I wear this do rag because it represents me? I don't know. That's the same thing I see when somebody says, "Oh, I like coming in with my pink hair and I come in authentic myself and I look queer and I am queer and I want people to know I'm queer." It's just like. At what point does that even matter? The people are coming here for a doctor, but your point is because this is a gender affirming doctor or surgeon, he wants to let people know that he's going to validate whatever they say. Imagine this. If somebody comes in and they don't have pink hair, they look pretty professional, you know, they're not trying to be eccentric in any way. Do you feel as safe with that person? Do you feel like they're going to validate you? Or do you feel like they're going to give you the hard, cold facts? Or do you think somebody who has the pink hair, blue glasses, and kind of comes off queer as they say i don't know uh, just weird to me but they come out queer what do you feel that you're going to get validated and that's always been my issue with when it comes to this whole group at all it's even in this interview she has a flag in the background saying i don't care what other people say if you come in here and say that you want to have a canal or you want to have a, 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 a volvoplasty or you want to have a fake penis and we can remove everything um, and there is another form that nobody ever talks about. There is surgeries where they don't remove the, odor, the ovaries and uterus, but they still give you a penis. What they end up doing is taking your vagina and just kind of make it um, into this like ball shape. And then they give you like, they take your clitoris and kind of move it forward and you kind of makes it like a small penis. But we're not going to get into that. My point is with these people, it's all about validation. And I think if you have a doctor who's so outspoken about being queer and going to gay bars and doing all this stuff, and they tell you, you know what? You're going to come in here and have a surgery. It doesn't really matter what other people say. I'm going to give it to you anyway. You need to run from that guy. You need a surgeon who says, well, maybe we shouldn't go through with this. Because you do understand the repercussions of doing all this kind of stuff. Because the way I feel that happens is you go into these surgeries or you go into this room and says, I want to have this surgery. And, you know, they obviously take like a month or two to get it set up. But you say you want to go in there and have this surgery. And they go, okay, cool. That's it. They may tell you that they may have to do, you know, their eth do be ethnical and be like ethnical. They have to be ethical and tell you, hey, look, this is what can happen. You may, more, you're, not, you're never going to be able to do this and now that. But they don't tell you like in a serious way. They're just kind of like, hey, I just want to let you know. You do understand if you have this closed up that you'll never be able to um, uh, reproduce and have children and stuff like that. Do you understand that? But this is going to help you with your dysphoria and everything. But you do understand that, you know, you're not going to be able to have sex and have kids like that. Right. You do understand. I just want to make sure. OK. Uh, anyway, and just go on about the day. Man, I hope you all enjoyed this interview. I'm out of here, man. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. I'm out of here. Peace.